welcome everyone to this week's Charla, Hunger, Food, Insecurity in the Latinx Community. Um, this is a critical issue we're discussing this afternoon, but I wanted to let everyone know that we are hosting an emergency Charla this Tuesday at four o'clock Eastern time entitled, How Can We Be Better Allies to the Black Community? We will have only Black speakers, including Afro-Latino, sharing their experiences, guidance, and calls to action to the Latino community and all other communities. Uh, this is a time we need to listen, we need to learn, we need to mobilize, and we need to serve in support of our African-American brothers, sisters, and non-binary familia going forward. Later in the week, on Friday, we will be hosting our Pride Charla, which will be amazing as it was last year. But for now, we're here to discuss hunger, food, and security in the Latinx and other communities as well. I want to thank uh, Steph Nyapari and Lisa Pino for bringing this topic to us. We listen, we learn, and we act. We have a remarkable group of Charla, I call them oradorxes, <laughs> may, that many have had a huge influence on me and our organization. I also want to quickly shout out Chef um, Ingrid Hoffman and as well as Jose Andres for being an inspiration to our organization in the food space. Latinos are twice as likely as white citizens to face food insecurity, and one in five Latino households have at least one person going hungry, according to Bread for the World. Also, Latinos are more likely to access, to lack access to healthy food, and Latino children are nearly twice as likely to lack access to sufficient nutritious food as non-Latino white children. Yet, Latinos are less likely to apply for SNAP, formerly known as food stamps. The Charla speakers will each have about five minutes and we encourage you to use the chat feature to express yourselves, ask questions or share information. These Charlas are interactive because we wanna learn and hear from our community. The first Charla Oradora is Lisa Pino, who is zooming in from New York and was the USDA Deputy Administrator of SNAP and served as USDA Deputy Assistant Secretary of Civil Rights and has worked in Latinx food insecurity for most of her life. She was a huge part of this Charla. So please welcome Lisa, whose pronouns are she and her. Thank you, Tony. Uh, well, first I wanna thank you, Tony, and Brenda and Steph, all of you for helping to galvanize us for such an important topic. Um, and also in solidarity to our black brothers and sisters, we are having this discussion during a most sobering and pivotal moment in our history um, in light of justice for George Floyd. Um, but, you know, communities are suffering all over the country and food insecurity has been one of the most vital issues for Latinx communities and all the more reason why, as we're the ones who advocate and get information out to communities in a trusted fashion and safe spaces, all the more reason to have this conversation today. Um, I am, as, as Tony said, the former deputy administrator of the SNAP program. I served, I can't believe it, it's been now 10 years. Um, and at the time when I came in to USDA, we too were facing a crisis because as you may remember, the, the recession had hit. So um, Tony is correct in that, you know, one out of every five uh, households in Latinx communities are facing food insecurity, but because I've worked uh, at the front line in terms of USDA as the Economic Research Service is the agency that houses and all this information and data for us to better know where the gaps are and how we can galvanize greater advocacy from a national level. Um, we used to, well, at USDA used to do, for instance, a Hispanic food insecurity report which has since ceased. And so I say all that because I think it's actually much higher. I think that whereas um, before this pandemic and the economic depression that we're seeing now, generally food insecurity was about 50, you know, 12 to 15% for the average population. It was about 26% for Latinos. I think that it's actually much higher. The issue is that we, re we really don't have a way to count that right now. Um, but you know, we're facing in Latino communities really the perfect storm of events. We already have historically bigger gaps in food insecurity. Um, we are also much more vulnerable to economic conditions. So for instance, in the Great Recession, Latinos lost 
66%, two thirds of their wealth during the recession. So imagine now. On top of that, Latinos are essential workers. We're on the front line, everything from farm workers um, to supporting restaurants. And on top of that, we now have uh, the doctrine of public charge, which is taken full effect and, and, and absolutely creating a strong chill factor. Nevertheless, uh, and, and participating in these USDA food nutrition service programs, but nevertheless, we have a great array of speakers. I want to just in the couple of minutes that I have give a really big picture because there are USDA food nutrition service programs that are still vital to the community. And as all of you are listening today, you know, where you can be that trusted person to help families in need get SNAP assistance for one. SNAP is really, you know, the, the biggest, it's the world's largest food aid program. Um, it, you know, was a $72 billion program under the recession, now even more so. So where you can help people, uh, you know, families enroll for SNAP. Families that are, you know, able to do it without the fear of public charge, or some of them have to make the hard decision of whether or not to enroll. Another critical program is WIC. Uh, more than six, more than 42% of WIC participants are actually Latino, and WIC does not have the immigration consequences of SNAP. So where we can encourage uh, Latino families, you know, parents, and uh, to get the benefit of WIC is essential. The third big area of where these you know, large USDA programs serve federal communities is of course school meals, school breakfast, school lunch, free and reduced price meals. Um, since schools have been closed, USDA has issued and, and Congress has issued emergency food aid and assistance, everything from you know, under the CARES Act, under the Families First Act, and instituting waivers. So for instance, you'll see like pandemic EBT that some states are participating in. Um, there's states like, like Texas, you know, where I know advocates on the ground are leveraging these funds to provide additional meals. So my, my big message uh, today, 30,000 foot message is that with everything happening, while people go to food banks and get emergency food to please also encourage people to sign up for these programs because they are vital to put food on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. That was so concise and informative that I cannot wait to be able to um, look at this again and, and access some of these resources that you've put together. The next up for this, uh, Charla, is another catalyst uh, for this, Charla. It's um, Stephanie Ampari from Washington, D.C. Um, she... They are the founder of the um, and president of Plantita Power. Steph will be discussing building a coalition to address LGBTQ plus hunger. And Steph goes by they and them. And I've seen that um, Steph is back on, I'm hoping, um, because I saw that they had jumped off. There you are. Steph, it's you're on. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Sorry for, for jumping in a little bit late. My name is Stephanie Opari, they, them pronouns. I'm with Plantita Power, the founder and current president. Plantita Power was formed after various different um, queer, non-binary, black, indigenous people of color would go to different gardens and feel out of place, um, weren't respected, were constantly misgendered throughout Washington, DC. Um, this group, felt like we should be able to do better. We should be able to build our own gardens. But again, you know, land access for us being able to purchase land to rent property is not only more um, difficult because of cost, but also because of identification, right? If you haven't gone through that process yourself, what does that look like? Especially here in an area where you can um, change your gender marker your passport is still, it still limits you, you know, so that's always been a trouble for a few of our uh, comrades. Well, um, this home is actually not mine. <laughs> Currently, we are building a sanctuary home for this weekend. We are coming together against police brutality for the QD BIPOC, which is the queer, trans, Black, Indigenous, and people of color community. And this is going to be an area where we're going to be cooking over a thousand pupusas, different plant-based meals. And again, in order to build coalition, we can't do this ourselves. We have over 15 different organizations and individuals that are taking part of this 
with donations, but also taking in consideration what does that relationship look like, right? I think there's a lot of nonprofits here and, and they, it would be really valuable for them to learn that you can't just direct message someone on Instagram that has um, over 5,000 likes and be like, hey, I see that you're doing this. How can I support? which is the case that happened today with a nonprofit that reached out and this nonprofit has a history of marginalizing and excluding queer vegans of color. So how do we turn that mind frame, you know, especially when you come from um, organizations with thousands of dollars and resources, it's not about right now there is a need. It's about, there's always a need. And in order to be able to tap into that, you really have to consider that we are also people and how do we, how do you speak to us? How do you network with us? How do you build this coalition, build this trust and relationship? So it's not a one-time thing. We are all building to liberation and we should be doing it together. So how does that work here with Plantita, Plantita Power? Again, we don't have an official garden space, but we do have gardens throughout DC. And this has taken form of folks who have access to land, who have houses, who have backyards that are able to give us the space and we can build onto, okay, we are also investing in your property. How can you invest into us? Does that mean just per, um, giving us that space? Or does that mean every month in exchange for our services, for taking care of your space, we are also giving you fruits, vegetables, and herbs, right? So currently we have seven different uh, community gardens. And this is really allowed for people that do work in nonprofits because some of these homes are by folks that um, aren't, involved in nonprofits in different um in i would say as senior staff as mid-level um can take back the knowledge that we share and the way that we work in terms of there is no hierarchy we are all putting in the same effort and the same work and receiving the same pay which is something very different than in nonprofit settings and corporate settings right so thinking about how do we really become equal how do we um, strive for that and in order to do so we always have to I think communicate with the people that we're working with we can't just expect a a response just because there looks like a, there's a dire need there's always been a need and until our government actually puts in the work and changes um for us we will need everyone to step up I think especially now with the Black Lives Matter movement um we, we understand that this is our responsibility. It is our responsibility to get educated. It is our responsibility to be there and follow and trust that the people that are in the front lines are telling us what to do and not getting not get into our feelings about it. And that goes the same for other communities that you are working with as well. So thank you so much for being here. And if you are in DC and want to offer us you know, your front yards or your backyards, please let us know. We are happy to work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Steph, for your fierce leadership and all you represent. I can't tell you how much I admire the work that you've done. Um, and again, your leadership, most than anything. Uh, and now somebody I've admired as a leader in education, as well as in civil rights, uh, it is an absolute privilege to have the president of the American Federation of Teacher Randy Weingard, who represents 1.7 million educators, school support staff, faculty, nurses, healthcare professionals, in addition to our beloved children. Uh, Land Randy will discuss an educator's role in food insecurity and goes by she and her. And I want to thank my good friend Cesar um, for um, recommending that Randy take part in this. It, it is an absolute privilege to have her join us. Thank you, Tony. And um, I really appreciate being with all of you and you know it's and i too as i think the senator is wearing a orange shirt um because there are so many other um uh there are so many other um uh fights we still have to do we're in the middle of three crises right now i would actually say three or four a racial justice crisis an economic crisis a uh, pandemic healthcare crisis all made worse by the lack of the kind of federal action that um, we've heard about today, even though we, you know, we're, we're, we've been turning ourselves into a pretzel, um, trying to deal with SNAP and WIC, all of these things are really important, but we need to have much more fulsome funding go through these um, vessels 
in order to feed America. And in all of these crises, excuse me, um, the people who are getting hurt the most are um, basically families and kids of color. And you've just heard a whole bunch of the statistics. I won't say them, you know, they, they, I won't repeat them in the limited time I have, but let me talk about what we've tried to do and the idea that we have that we're working with World Central Kitchen and other of the feeding organizations on. Um, we, you know, from, we actually did our first coronavirus press conference on February 2nd or February 4th, because none of us are stupid. You can read what's going on in, in China. And we really, if, could you imagine, without repeating the history, if we had had the month of February to prepare in terms of actually preparing grab and goes, preparing for remote learning, doing all of those things before you had to pause the economy and basically turn on a dime to have remote learning for all that time, um, for all this time. Could you imagine if we could have gotten um, Chromebooks to everyone and gotten them with translations so parents could have seen it? Could you imagine if we had worked, we could have worked with all these internet companies for connectivity? And so we're basically saying, shame on us. We're not going to have the lack of preparation again as we try to um, navigate out of the pandemic and as we're dealing with a huge economic crisis, even with today's news, we still have um, uh, over 18 million people who have been unemployed in the last two months. And so what is also a through line here? It's amazing that we've had the infrastructure to do the grab and goes in so many schools. The kind of work that LA, um, Little Rock, other places have done. Um, one of my personal heroes, Yolanda Fisher from Dallas, um, running a kitchen every single day, um, feeding um, thousands and thousands of kids. But the food insecurity is so great we need to open these school kitchens for all summer, for all families. Not just what we can kind of sneak through for family feeding through our kids. We need to actually, these kind of kitchens who actually have made 5 billion meals, lunch meals last year, 2.5 billion breakfast meals last year. Could you imagine if through the Heroes Act, through the partnerships we've had with not-for-profits, faith community, and with restaurants and restaurateurs and great chefs. Could you imagine if we could actually open all these kitchens all summer and deal with food insecurity so that those huge lines of cars at food banks, they could actually have access to meals in schools. That's part of what schools should be able to do. And that's what we're trying to work with the longstanding food um, uh, groups to see if we can push the Congress to not only get what's in the HEROES Act, but have a vision for doing this this summer um, for all of America. Um, and we'd love to work with you on this and to work obviously on all of these issues, but see if we can be even bolder than we are right now. Thank you, Tony. Thank you all of you for all the work that you have done in terms of nurturing our kids, feeding our kids, and dealing with all of these crises, including the crisis of xenophobia and racial um, discrimination and racism. I don't know if Randy Weingarten could be any bolder, but I'd love to see it, um, especially after your years of uh, demonstrating that boldness. Uh, thank you very much. I count us in, in terms of supporting anything that would open up um, you know, these school kitchens uh, throughout the entire summer. I, it just is a brilliant, brilliant idea, and I'm sure everyone would support it, uh, given what we're dealing with right now. And it's about to get even worse over the summer with the schools That's closed. Right. You know, normally, it's two months of families trying to figure out how to feed children where their only meals are um, during, the, during the school day. Um, and now there's an additional four months to that. That can yeah. be pretty devastating. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Eric Cooper with the San Antonio Food Bank. He will be talking about network of food banks. Eric goes by he and him. Um.
super excited to be with you guys today and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I represent one of the 200 food banks across the United States that make up Feeding America. Um, every community has a food bank and I encourage you to go to feedingamerica.org to find your local food bank. In Texas, we actually have 21 food banks and I serve 16 counties of the 254 counties in the great state of Texas. Um, headquartered here in San Antonio, we partner with about 550 different nonprofit charities. So when you think about your local food bank, they would provide food to all of the nonprofit charities uh, that are distributing and needing food, whether uh, faith-based organizations uh, running food pantries or traditional nonprofits uh, like the Salvation Army or the Boys and Girls Clubs or congregate feeding sites, uh, soup kitchens, uh, senior centers, uh, battered women's shelters. Uh, it's our privilege to work the food industry literally from field to fork, uh, farmers and growers, food manufacturers, food processors, um, great grocery uh, wholesalers and retailers, um, to restaurants, hotels, caterers, places that have prepared food to be eaten and it's not we rescue those leftovers uh, and some very creative strategies. Uh, here in South Texas, we, we process uh, several hundred thousand pounds of, of uh, wild game. So it's it really built on a waste not, want not, um, refrigerated, frozen, non-perishable, and non-food items. Uh, uh, the San Antonio Food Bank is the largest distributor of pet food. Um, to to families with uh, you know four legged uh, family members, uh, uh, but school supplies, uh, lots of uh, merchandise comes through the food banks as uh, as we work with those uh, companies that that are donating the product. Um, we are in a framework of basically um, three tiers of response to families. Uh, we, we call it food for today food for tomorrow and food for a lifetime. Our food for today strategies is really about um, connecting people immediately to food. And that's either through uh, you know, one of our food pantries or through uh, one of our pop-up distributions, which many of you have probably seen in this COVID-19 crisis, which has become a, a, a way to get food to families following COVID protocols making sure that we're keeping um, the appropriate distancing and keeping families safe. And at the onset of the crisis, when many grocery stores didn't um, have the inventory in their stores to be able to sell those groceries, uh, we could get groceries to families quickly. Um, but our, our second tier is really about food for tomorrow. And it was so great to hear from uh, Lisa Pino um, she's a, a great champion in, in federal programs, and I tell you, we miss her leadership in, in D.C. as we speak. Um, but the food bank really works now, once providing food for today, to really talk with families about those federal safety net programs like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, uh, WIC, um, Women, Infants, and Children, um, or whether or not they have health care. So the Medicaid program or the Children's Health Insurance program here in Texas for seniors, long-term care. But it's really a holistic offering of, of food bank programs and federal benefits that stabilize the, the, the household in our Food for Tomorrow strategies. But ultimately, it's about food for a lifetime. And uh, we really want to help families move to self-sufficiency and self-reliance. And so we have many strategies dedicated to workforce development um, um, and job placement. And so um, the true answer uh, to hunger um, is really uh, a living wage and really trying to get families um, earning more so that they can provide for themselves. And San Antonio is a very hardworking, very humble uh, community. Um, when you think about the federal poverty line, just for a family of four, um, that's $26,000. So if you, if you make um, $26,000, 200 is the actual number, uh, you fall below poverty. And so that, 
for a family of four is very difficult to, to be able to make it. And so uh, the SNAP program runs uh, about 135% of poverty. So you're able to make that and, and then some uh, and still qualify to receive that benefit. For most food banks uh, running um, different programs, we, we go up to 185% of poverty. So um, for that family of four, you could be making um, up to $48,000 a year, which still um, for many markets across the country, that just is just not enough to pay rent and utilities, transportation expenses, and put food on the table. And so what we saw in the COVID-19 crisis is so many of those families that might have been a four-person household um, making, you know, 50000 or 55000 and then um, never knowing the food bank um, and with the cut in hours or maybe being furloughed from their hotel or restaurant or hospitality industry job, um, they, they um, showed up in our lines. Uh, we went from feeding 60,000 people a week um, to 120,000 people a week. And we've been continuing to see that 120,000 people a week um, since the onset of COVID. Now, many of our programs target children and, and seniors. Um, and I just wanted to highlight, as Randy talked about partnering with schools, we are so blessed to have about 180 school districts throughout our 16 county service territory. And we work with many of them. And I just got back from a distribution that we had at the North Side Independent School District where we had 2,000 families um, at their uh, high school football stadium where we were feeding um, those 2,000 families um, with groceries. And the faculty and the coaches and everyone was out there and um, we were able to make sure all 2,000 families got food. Um, but there's a great program that that came through the CARES Act called Pandemic Electronic Benefit Transfer, um, or PEBT. Now, most states are running them a little bit different, but for Texas, it actually created a benefit for families whose children were receiving uh, um, uh, breakfast and lunch through the National School Lunch Program, um, uh, a stipend which would cover the meals that they missed from the time schools closed at the onset of COVID through the end of the school year. Um, so this electronic benefit is uh, equal to $285. For the state of Texas, it was actually $1 billion. And just here in San Antonio, $59 million in PEBT benefits. Now, families that were already on SNAP got that benefit loaded onto their electronic benefit card, which is called the Lone Star card here in Texas. And then families that were not participating in SNAP have to apply online to get that benefit. But ultimately, it's programs like PEBT and SNAP that will help us get families out of our parking lots and into grocery stores. But it's going to be the strengthening of the economy and a living wage that will pull them out of our food pantries and, and into grocery stores so that they can nourish themselves and their families. So thank you, uh, Aaron. Thank you. I really appreciate all your work and all of this information that you've just given us, uh, especially what's going on specifically in Texas and San Antonio. Uh, next up, we have um, the mayor of Tolson, Arizona. Um, please welcome Anna Tovar, who's Presentation is cities are at the front line of COVID-19. Couldn't be more true. And the mayor goes by the pronouns she and her. Thank you, Antonio. And thank you, Lisa, for inviting me to be on this panel. It's just been great to listen so far and learn. Um, as I, I'm from uh, the city of Tolleson, we are just west of the city of Phoenix. So I've been blessed to be uh, raised in the city my entire life to give you a snapshot of our city. We're a small city. Uh, we are designated as a rural city uh, here in Tolleson. We've been in existence for almost uh, 100 years. And we are six square miles. We have about 7,500 uh, residents that call Tolleson home and 80% um, of our population is uh, of Latino. And during our work days, uh, we have about 28,000 employees uh, and the vast majority of those are uh, essential workers. Uh, so when 
the issue of hunger and food insecurity is something that we're definitely very familiar with in our city, the city of Tolleson. Uh, we've been tackling this issue, I would say, for quite a while, but I would say with COVID-19, it just definitely brought to light in regards to um, our population that was most uh, marginalized. I'd say for the past four years, um, uh, as mayor, I've been advocating for a grocery store here in our community. So we don't have a grocery store and a lot of our residents, uh, transportation is their biggest barrier um, from getting their food. And so we continue on that aspect of trying to push forward on having the availability of a grocery store near them where they can walk and get fresh food. Um, I was blessed to uh, be part of a, a migrant community that my grandparents um, were migrant farm workers, but were very entrepreneurial in spirit and open up what was first a, a food stand for uh, field workers. And then from there, uh, it turned into something a little bit bigger. By the time I, I was born, it was a full-fledged grocery store. We were probably one of the small mom and pop grocery stores here in our city. And so when I was three days old until I was 33 years old, uh, I helped operate our family store and saw the need of hunger and food insecurity and just blessed to have uh, been raised by my grandparents and parents who allowed people to come to our store um, to get food, even though they didn't have money to pay for it. Um, we would set up you know, a system with them and it was a barter system where they were able to get food and things that they needed for their family and help out one another in the community. So I would say from an early age, um, I have, that has been instilled um, as a value for me and it just has led me to make sure that my community, especially during COVID-19 time, has uh, food because it is essentially 80% of our uh, students here in Tolleson are on free and reduced lunch. And being a former educator at one of our schools, I know that for the vast majority of our students, um, you know, breakfast and lunch was a crucial meal for them and probably their only meal. A hot meal for them while they were at school. So we were um, proud to be one of the first small cities in Arizona to actually shut down our city during COVID-19 time. We took action uh, very promptly uh, because not only do we have um, a high senior population where we have um, also a multi-generational households, uh, we are low to uh, moderate income community, uh, but we also have um, the only meat packing plant in the entire state of Arizona uh, in our city. So I knew that swift and quick action was needed and we started very, very quickly um, with our most vulnerable populations. So we transferred into home deliveries for our seniors. Uh, we collaborated uh, with our local school districts to start uh, deliveries of food, uh, breakfast, and lunch. So I would say from the day that we closed our city and when the schools closed the very next day, uh, we had up to 14 sites in our city that were uh, had breakfast and lunch uh, ready for our school children um, from preschool all the way up to uh, high school. And then we even opened it up to 18 and, and beyond shortly thereafter because we saw the need during the first couple of days. Uh, to date, our elementary school has served over 360,000 meals since March 1st. Um, and also our high school has served about 235,000 meals. Um, we've transitioned to, uh, we have one food bank in our, in our town that's now open for five days a week. Uh, we have a produce uh, called Stella's Market where they're out giving fresh produce twice a month. And that was, Stella was a, a cafeteria employee for about 25 years at one of our schools. And when she passed away from cancer, uh, we wanted to remember her because she felt it was very, very important for our school children to have those uh, uh, produce and our vegetables and fruits. And um, we're also, uh, I've been collaborating uh, with our our team and at the state legislature uh, this Saturday, we're going to be a, doing a food box distribution uh, here in our city as well too. Uh, we have, we anticipate about 200 people coming through and we have about 300 boxes prepared already. Uh, we have opened up our community kitchen. 
um, in our rec center as well too to help out with families um, and to help feed. Uh, we got quite quite unique because when you are faced with a lot of barriers and financial assistance uh, had yet to come from our from our state. Uh, we did our census challenge where residents that completed the census, the city purchased uh, $50 gift cards. Um, and at that point, uh, citizens, once they showed proof they, they completed the census, uh, they were given a $50 gift card to one of our small uh, local restaurants here in our city. Uh, right. I'm sorry, I'm probably went over time, but uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate the time that you've given me to share. Thank you. No, thank you for, for everything that you're doing. And um, like I said, my sister doesn't live far away from you, so I'm definitely going to stop by and say hello. Um, and now please greet someone that has inspired me for the last seven years since I first met her at her humanitarian respite center in Rio Grande Valley, uh, Texas, right on the border with Mexico. Uh, sister Norma Pimentel is the uh, executive director of Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley. And I have witnessed firsthand um, the needs that she fills every single day on both sides of the border, feeding families, feeding children that would otherwise go hungry. Uh, Sister Norma lives the verse, for I was hungry and you gave me food, for I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. So please welcome a true hero of mine uh, and a, my good friend and partner. Uh, we support her in every way we can, Sister Norma Pimentel. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, can I, you hear me well? Yes? Good. Uh, muchas gracias. Este, you know, when it comes to hunger, like you said, I've been very close with mostly the immigrant families, the poor families, especially here in our Rio Grande Valley. And you know, one story, one experience that I directly had with children has really touched me and has always made me want to be able to bring food to the table to so many families that need it. And when I was able to, we were distributing food to some families that they were immigrants and, and here in the Rio Grande Valley. And, and as I was giving something to a child, he, he turned around and put it away. He just ate a piece of it and saved the rest. And, and I said, mijo, ¿por qué no te lo comes? You know, what, why aren't you eating it? And, and I said, it's because I'm going to take it to my father who's back over there at the center. And, you know, it really touched me to see how a child can just eat a portion and leave the rest for the family because they knew that they hadn't eaten and they want to share that the goodness of whatever it is that we're enjoying being able to share with the rest of the family. And so I think that when children have to do that, that's because because they're hungry and they, they haven't had a chance to eat uh, plentifully. And, and so I made it one of my missions to make sure that we reach out to as many families and, and feed them and help them. And so that has been one of the things that we have been able to do here in the Rio Grande Valley with the immigrants. Uh, as you have seen when you've come down here to, uh, to our center, uh, Antonio and all of you who have been here, you have seen the thousands of families that have arrived to our center and, and the food has been a, a very important part of who we are. You know, it's part of our culture, celebrating our life through what we eat. And it doesn't matter what you give them, as long as it's con amor, it, it's good, you know? And they enjoy whether it's just rice and beans and become something wonderful to eat and they they truly are grateful for that and and just that feeling and that share of what they do you know how we can uh come together at the table and share a meal is it's amazing and and it's always something good and and presently right now with the pandemic and having so many families especially the immigrant families here in the Rio Grande Valley who live here for quite a while most of them have lost their job and they're hungry and they, they don't have food at the table. And so we're making an extra effort to, to every week take 1,500 uh, bags of grocery to families throughout the different counties that we have here in the Valley. And today precisely my staff is in, in uh, Escobares distributing boxes of produce that we're getting. And, and so we're, my job is to reach out to everyone and anyone that is willing to join us and share with them uh, us the, their resources so that we can share with those families that really need it. And, uh, and so right now in Matamoros, we have 
several thousands that are there stranded because of this uh, policy that the United States has with abandoning them there and waiting, I don't know, until when. And um, one of the main things we have to do for them is feed them, you know, and so uh, food insecurity and the need to eat is part of who we are and what we must share that with one another. And so I'm glad that we can be instrumental in making sure our families, our children get to eat. And I just want to take a point of privilege as the host. Um, Sister Roma, what is going on on the other side of the border? Because I feel as though as they've cut off immigrants from even claiming asylum at this point, totally. or even getting near the border, can you just give us a couple of minutes on what you've seen across those bridges um, in Maravillas yes. and other areas? Antonio, you know, right now, because of the pandemic, not only have they been waiting on the other side for almost a year because the process has become very slow in, in trying to ask for asylum, they put a hearing every three months and now not even that now because of the pandemic there's reason to tell them you know what we can't see you at all until until further notice and so basically they're just waiting there We're so discouraged and and in conditions that are so difficult they either have extreme heat you know with and or wind or and right now what we have is it's, it's a lot of thunderstorms we have a, a tropical storm in the in the gulf and so we have we having this terrible thunderstorms in in our area all this last week and and this week and so all of the tents and this tent city that has been there for so long all those little tents are just down and uh, everything is wet it's flooded lodo por todos lados and that's what we're seeing right now and so at the same time trying to meet their needs and making sure they have food to eat and it's a mess and so it's so it's like hopeless you know to see them there and and not be able to to do anything about making sure that they can get across and they can get due process and they can be able to ask for asylum you know you go so far you get to the border and you still have so far left to go even though it's right yeah. there that's totally yeah. true it's also so unfortunate that instead of doing something about their pain and suffering we simply increase that pain and suffering to these families you know instead of being a country that upholds dignity and respect to life we totally turn our backs on them well you'll never turn your backs on them sister norma thank you again for inspiring me and so many of us and um truly love you because we know that that love's going to be radiated to millions of others that need it so thank you sister I Gracias, appreciate Antonio. everything you do. I love to hear you. Um, up, up next from Washington, D.C. is uh, Miguel Basias, who is the lead organizer of They Them Collective and will be presenting our community hot din din service. Uh, Miguel goes by They and Them. Hi, my name is Michael Basias. I am one of the co organizers of They Them Collective, who one of our projects is centered around. Um, addressing um, food scarcity within the DMV area that is centered around the lives of black and brown and indigenous and Latinidad, queer, trans, non-binary folks. Um, I want to emphasize that many of uh, the, the basis of also um, Hot Thin is about addressing um, anti-Asian supplement through COVID and by cooking meals that are centered around Asian cuisine like Filipino food, that has a lot of um, intersecting with um, um, Spanish, in like Spanish culture, because Philippines have been colonized by Spain. Um, we have um, crossovers with meal, and it has been very accessible for a lot of Latinidad and queer trans folks. Um, um, we serve meals in a, about 40 meals a week. The way we go about it is that we um, we serve vegan, non-vegan, and also um, um, gluten-free. Um, how we approach the situation is that we um, ask our comrades to always um, be mindful when they're in the kitchen how they cook. We wear a mask, we wash our hands. We have a deployment where there are people in the kitchen that cooks and the people in the front actually delivers the food and the people from the, uh, the car that actually, uh, picks up the meal, they pick it in the front door. So there is social distancing. <clears throat> um, um, how our, our, our meal is actually set up, we, um, we believe that 
queer, trans, non-binary folks, particularly migrants, who I feel like J1 workers in Philippines and also J1 workers from South America, who are now currently don't have access to resources because they have lost their work in restaurants and have now dependent on, on the graces of other people, has not really been able to access resources through the state. Because one, there is an anxiety that comes with having to lose their immigration status due to Trump asking, prevent, punishing them from having to use any sort of um, um, government assistance as part of the assessment of their status. That's preventing them from even going to food stamps or, or getting access to any sort of public assistance. So our form of stepping in is to provide resources to the community that is accessible to them. Um, the, way we go about, uh, the way we go about this is that we reach out through our communities first, um, um, local farmers, people who then dumpster diving in the community because we also believe on a zero waste um, um, practices where communities and <laughs> grocery stores tend to do a lot of produce. And at the same time, we do a zero budget plan where we ask actually sometimes our neighborhoods if they have um, remnants of food that is lying around that we can repurpose and make meals. We also believe on having a good accessible meals because a lot of queer and trans folks at this moment do have anxiety coming out and even preparing their own food. And having hot meals should be accessible for everybody because um, at the end of the day, that um, hot food should not be a luxury item, should be a human right. And this is a crisis that we are dealing with in this country at this moment, where something, what a lot of politicians, a lot of politicians do speak about solidarity, about addressing food sovereignty, but what will end up happening is that the bottom pole, which is the bottom, bottom of the 99%, are not having access to these food, including undocumented queer trans folks and non-binary folks of color. Um, how are we moving forward to the situation? I think that if there's any um, watershed moment for anybody, it's that it's very important to support your local um, organizations that are not just nonprofit, but also grassroots organizations are led by supporting and financing the projects that are being done in the community. So it's very important to divest resources than to do to anchor these projects. Thank you for sharing your space. <laughs> Michael, that was fantastic. And you're right here in Washington, D.C. And we okay. definitely need to get together and, and talk about how we can help support you're what you're doing. You're um, my, my kids are half Filipino. So oh, yay. we are I, family. I always believe that like in, in we as Latinidad and Filipinx, we've shared a culture overcoming federal colonialism and overcoming the implication of white supremacy. So it's very important to understand that whether if it's uprooting the colonial clout over our native communities, or whether overcoming the subtle occupation that is plaguing our lands, it's very important that we have a shared culture at the end of the day, and we must support each other because we don't have anybody else instead of each Absolutely. other. I came from Absolutely. San Diego, and I came in San Diego, a lot of Mexican community and um, Filipino community have always crossed, um, crossed intersect with each other. So it's very important for us to recognize that moving forward. Thank you. Well, Cesar Chavez had a lot of help as well. That was a partnership between the Mexican and Filipino communities. So um, thank you for everything you're doing. Now, next up is the Arizona State Senator Martin Quisada. Uh, calling in from Phoenix, and his presentation is The Pandemic Has Exposed Underlying Biases. This could not be more relevant right now. Uh, the senator goes by he and him. Senator? All right, well, thank you, sir. It's, a, it's a re really an honor to be here. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me be, be part of this charla. Uh, my name is Martin Casada. I serve the people of Maryville and Glendale uh, in Legislative District 29 in the State Senate here. Um, I'm a big believer in the intersectionality of a lot of these issues, uh, and that's why I'm wearing orange today, like Ms. Weingarten was, as a sign of my commitment to ending gun violence for National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Um, so given everything that's happening in the world right now, uh, with our nation kind of being fed up with the, um, the systemic and the systematic um, oppression of, of people of color at the, at the hands of law enforcement, and efforts to identify um, anti-racist ways of thinking about current public policy 
and any proposals put forward, I think it's important for us to also acknowledge the systemic and systematic ways uh, that, that racist policies impact people of color in other ways too, and that absolutely includes hunger uh, in our uh, Latino community. Um, our, food in, our food insecurity doesn't happen by accident. Um, a government's choices in, in what we fund and what we do not fund reflects our values and reflects who is uh, believed to deserve to have uh, food security and who isn't. Um, I think the unfortunate rea reality is that um, you know, the difference between the haves and the have-nots, it's as wide now as it has ever been. Uh, and it's there by design and it will require a very intentional effort for us to deconstruct it uh, and reform it um, in a way that, uh, that, that, that gives people what they deserve. Um, so th I think this is true whether we are describing you know, differential treatment at the hands of law enforcement in our criminal justice system, access to public education and job opportunities, access to clean air and water, or the public health of our communities, which is impacted heavily uh, by our access to healthy food. Um, so the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has shown, it's, it's really shown a, a new light on all of this. Um, and here in Arizona, we've seen the impacts of our state's decisions not to invest directly uh, in black and brown communities or the decision not to invest in the programs and the safety nets that assist uh, black and brown families. Uh, and that's become uh, very painfully obvious um, over the last few months. So here in Arizona, I mean, obviously 18 to 19% um, of, our, of our population experiences food insecurity and our children suffer at a higher rate uh, of close to 27 and up to 29%. And those numbers um, uh, are actually, like Lisa was saying earlier, are, are probably much lower than, than the reality. Um, of course, our communities of color are disproportionately impacted. Uh, our Navajo County is one of the highest food insecurity rates in the entire nation. Uh, and they're like at 26.2%, which is again is a low number uh, or, or a, a low estimate. Um, Latino families in Arizona are younger, and our kids are now the majority in our public school system. So we're also very much disproportionately impacted. Um, so with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, as it's causing um, major public health and economic crisis, uh, the effects of it are going to be widespread, and it will absolutely include additional hardships for already vulnerable populations like our Latino community. So even though we, we do have problems, or we do have programs like SNAP, um, which is important. Uh, it, it's an important first line of defense for our communities. Some new monies have come in, and some new monies have come into those programs. It's not close to enough uh, as the previous lack of investment um, is showing. And the need for increased investment is absolutely necessary for our communities to weather this crisis and, and, and the normal crises that, that impact our families every day when we live in poverty. Um, the state's effort, uh, to supplement these programs or increase our own have, have, have been there, but they've been barely noticeable. A million dollars to food bank assistance, 500,000 to expand our double up food, food bucks program, uh, $250,000 to expand the Arizona produce purchasing program. Uh, these efforts are nice, they're good, but they're clearly, clearly not enough. And so many in our community are turning to charitable food assistance now uh, to make those ends meet. Um, but the, the pandemic has impacted them as well. Uh, and, and they're facing increased demand and, and combined with decreased donations and fewer volunteer availability. Um, and our schools have been communicating to me the incredible level of unmet need that they're experiencing as they try to keep our students and their families fed every single day. So what we're seeing is that the COVID-19 pandemic has dealt a very serious body blow to our community uh, and we were already facing system, systematic inequity. Um, the effects of, of the potential of absolutely being uh, long-term, they have the potential of absolutely being long-term um, and, and uh, sorry about that, and, 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 and the, the, food in, the food insecurity will lead to health issues and job loss, and that'll mm -hmm. impact our students' performance in school. It'll contribute to mental health issues and it'll further involve you know, our communities in, in the criminal injustice system as well. So ultimately, I guess to, to sum it up, uh, we need systemic and systematic change. Uh, we're realizing that um, in any cri crisis, whether it's the coronavirus or police abuse or our communities and our communities of color are gonna be impacted more and it's up to us as policymakers to get that done. And it's up to us as impacted communities to expect nothing less to demand more and to hold our elected leaders accountable. So thank you guys again for having me. I appreciate being here.
Thank you, Martin. I will um, look at the replay of this because I was taking notes feverishly. Um, it's, it's a very important perspective that you just gave us in terms of how it has exposed these biases that were always there, um, but now it's even more pronounced. And now from Los Angeles, California, Betsabel Estudio, who is a senior advocate at California Food Policy Advocates, and we'll be talking about food insecurity in California uh, during her five-minute charla. Betsabel goes by she and her. Thank you, Antonio, and I um, thank you for inviting me to this conversation. I have a really quick presentation for folks because I'm going to be sharing some important data that actually has come out in the last couple weeks. Um, but first, I, I have to say, um, you know, my presentation is also focused on food insecurity in the Latino and immigrant community because we can't talk about Latino issues um, unless we talk about how it, uh, our immigrant um, community who is um, disproportionately being impacted by this current public health crisis. Um, so next slide. So um, like I mentioned, I have a little bit of data to share just so that folks know sort of what is the what does food insecurity look like in the state of California? So um, I'll begin by saying that this public health crisis and the economic effects are increasing the hardships for many Californians, but especially for Latino, Latinx and uh, immigrant communities who are at greater risk of food insecurity. Um, some really astonishing data that has just come out is that um, one is the Urban Institute, um, their health reform monitoring survey found that Latinx adults um, we're more than twice as likely to report food insecurity in the last 30 days. So this data was in, during the impact on anal 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 um, analyzing the impact of COVID-19. Um, and then a recent U.S. Um, Census Bureau survey conducted in mid-May showed that while 36% of California adults identify as Latinx, 60% of those adults in households experience, um, are experience, uh, experiencing food hardships identify as Latinx. So we have a large number of um, Latinx adults in our state that are facing food insecurity um, and food hardship in response to COVID-19. Um, and then, of course, we have um, public charge, you know, that is still um, looming and folks are still very afraid about this new rule. And so while the federal government continues to attack immigrants with their policies and their rhetoric, um, our state of California has like has committed to support immigrants, whether those are um, investments and um, new programs that we have available, but also in the way that we welcome our immigrants in our state. Um, but the reality is that there's still a fear of public charge, um, even in the midst of this pandemic. And um, once again, a new survey that came out from Urban Institute found that one in six adults in California, um, California immigrant families reported avoiding public benefits like Medi-Cal and CalFresh in 2019. Um, so next slide, please. Um, I also just wanted to highlight that um, in our state of California, like I mentioned, um, our state has been very welcoming of immigrants. And so what that means is that we have a number of food and nutrition programs that are available to our immigrant communities, um, regardless of immigration status. And I, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can take a look at here. But I specifically want to highlight pandemic EBT because it is a new program that, that our state has implemented. Um, this benefit um, is uh, very much welcome in the immigrant community because um, it is giving immigrant families um, a card loaded with uh, money um, and for them to be able to purchase groceries uh, for their children during the closure of their school. So, um, Families have already been receiving this pandemic EBT card. Others are applying and they have until the end of June 30th to apply. Um, there's a lot of questions that we're getting, a lot of um, confusion around our you know, impact of public charge. Um, uh, and but we're we're making sure that we're addressing those concerns and promoting the program. Um, we're at the same time we're uh, mobilizing our partners, both the food and nutrition advocates and immigrant rights partners, to mobile to work together to um, encourage uh, to urge our federal government um, to extend some of these um, waivers that have made it easier to for uh, immigrant and Latinx communities to access food um, and to extend these waivers in the summer because we know that you know um, uh, hunger and, and um, access to food doesn't end when at the end of June right we know we need the, the, um, these uh, opportunities in the summer as well so um, next slide 
Um, I also wanted to highlight our CalFresh program um, because there's some really good data that has also showed the way that it's benefiting our Hispanic and Latinx community. So um, just really quickly, CalFresh is our SNAP program, um, just for those that may not be aware. Um, it all, uh, there, our CalFresh program, and just like SNAP, is the only nutrition program that has immigration-based eligibility restrictions, and that's very unfortunate and um, we are working to try to figure out how we remove immigration status as a barrier to accessing food. Um, but um, CalFresh um, is available for citizen children. And so we've been doing a lot of work in promoting um, the CalFresh program um, and letting mixed status households know that even though parents are undocumented, their US citizen children or children who have a uh, legal residency may, um, may be eligible for the program and they should apply and not be worried at all about public charge or any impact to the immigration status. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, uh, there's, um, we have uh, probably one of the lowest participation rates in our call fresh across people who would be eligible. And so we're trying to really promote this program, especially now when there's such a need. Um, but we know that a lot of uh, the majority of the CalFresh participants are our communities. Uh, a 2018 uh, report showed that about 45% of CalFresh participants are Hispanic and Latinx. That's huge. Um, and this is before the whole COVID-19 crisis. And so um, we know that those numbers have increased significantly and we're doing everything we can to continue to promote this program, especially because now our CalFresh program um, has new uh, flexibilities that have increased benefits, our monthly benefits, and that make it easier to access um, the program. Um, and then, uh, next slide, please. And then lastly, I'll just end it with um, one of the campaigns that we're working on here, um, uh, our nutrition um, and food advocates and immigrant partners are working on a food for all campaign. Like I mentioned, uh, we strongly believe that immigration status should not be a barrier to accessing food assistance. And so no nutrition program should have that ex exclusion. And so we're working together to imagine a food for all campaign. Um, we were thinking, uh, we've been thinking about kicking off soon. Of course, um, we're now under this new context of, of a public health crisis. So we're trying to reimagine what that looks like. And so um, next slide, if you wanted to get more information, we definitely um, urge you to subscribe to our alerts or reach out to me if you want to learn more about our Food for All campaign. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to Anthony. Thank you, Ms. Arel. I appreciate everything you're doing in California. It's also great to be able to have people from different parts of the country, from San Antonio, from, um, from California, from Los Angeles, from Arizona and different parts of Arizona, as well as Washington, D.C. And, and Lisa's in New York. So uh, during these charlas, we also want the diversity of where people are calling in from to represent the different um, uh, perspectives. Um, so next up is uh, somebody that also has been a huge inspiration for me and the work we do at HHF. Uh, we have partnered on efforts to protect our precious farm workers through the Mass for Farm Workers campaign. She was one of the founders of the Time's Up movement, as well as Latinx House to diversify Hollywood. Uh, this is truly my sister. Uh, please welcome from Fremont, Ohio, Monica Ramirez, who is the founder and president of Justice for Migrant Women, and she will discuss feeding the nation while facing food insecurity. Monica. Thank you. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. I've been so inspired by everything that everyone has been sharing. Um, you know, I. I am the daughter and granddaughter of migrant farm workers. So when I think about the issue of food insecurity, one of the cruelest ironies that, um, that I think about coming from a farm worker background is that the farm workers who labor in the fields every single day um, don't have enough food to eat. And it's not just because of the COVID crisis. This has been a longstanding problem for our community. Um, for those of you who are tuning in who maybe don't have as much background in the farm worker community, you know, there are two, 0.5 to 3 million farm workers across our nation who are working in the fields and packing sheds and in nurseries to make sure that food makes it to our tables. And of the farm workers um, who are working in, in, across our country, 83% are Latinx. Um, about 19% of those farm workers are migrant workers, which means they're moving from town to town and state to state in order to do the work to feed us. And um, what most people don't realize about the farm worker community is that still today, farm workers don't have enough rights. Farm workers have been excluded from most of the federal protections for workers for over 30 years. 
uh, for over 80 years. And for, for the past, uh, you know, for decades now, we have organizations like the United Farm Workers and many others that have been trying to win more protections for farm workers. Um, but still today, the reality is that farm workers on average, a family doesn't earn more than $24,000 a year. And if you're a farm worker woman who's working in our nation, uh, the average uh, income is about $11,000 a year. So long before this COVID crisis, there wasn't enough money for farm workers to be able to feed themselves and their families. And I, I raise this because as Steph said, when she was talking, food insecurity and hunger isn't a new problem for our community, not for farm workers or for many people in the Latinx community. And uh, for farm workers, there are a number of barriers. You know, Mayor Tovar talked about some of these, not having access to stores to provide good food to farm workers and others in our communities, not having access to transportation. Farm workers often rely on others to transport them to work and um, to the laundromat and to the grocery store. And if there's no one to transport them, then that means that they won't have access to places where they can get good food. Um, and unfortunately, because many of our community members live in food deserts, um, they have difficulty finding good nutritious food in order to feed their families. Um, the other thing, that that we know is the case is that even where there are small stores in areas where farm workers are living those start stores don't necessarily sell the food that we would consider culturally appropriate and i want to say that while we're talking today about the latinx community the farm worker community is also comprised of people from other racial and ethnic backgrounds and i and i lift that up uh, because i want to mention the fact that we do have Black farm workers in our community. We do have um, immigrant farm workers who are of different ethnic and racial backgrounds. And so um, I say that because I think the commonality, the experience of the farm worker community, which is, is, is tied to, to understanding the, the context of migration and having poor housing and not having labor rights, um, the same issues related to poverty and food insecurity exist across the board, um, regardless of, of the racial or ethnic background of the farm worker. Um, who's doing this work. Um, and one of the compounding factors that exists for food insecurity for the farm worker community is that many of the uh, farm workers in our nation are immigrants and the overwhelming majority of farm workers are undocumented. And so when Lisa was talking about access to WIC and SNAP and some of these programs, you know, as was mentioned already, there's so much fear for immigrants to come forward to ask for help whether they qualify or not. And so many farm workers who we've spoken to uh, simply don't feel safe enough to be able to seek resources like food for their families. And, and, and so these are all major barriers for the community to overcome. And if you imagine those barriers already existing, now place them in the context of COVID. So our community was deemed by the federal government to be essential, but our community has been denied essential rights and benefits for decades. And still, with this COVID crisis, even though our community continues to go to work, the federal government has not deemed our community worthy enough to pro provide protections or benefits under the COVID packages that have passed. So what that's meant is that farm workers started reporting to us early, the weeks into the crisis, that they didn't have enough food to eat. When they went to stores because of hoarding, there was no food for them to buy. When they went to the food banks or wanted to go to the food banks, the food banks were often closed because the hours of work for farm workers, you know, farm workers start working very early in the day and often um, can't make it in the, in the working hours for some of the existing um, food programs. And so people talk to us about not being able to go to the food bank to get food. They also talk to us about the challenges of trying to get food for their children. Even though the school programs had been set up in order for um, families to be able to get food for their kids, the work that their working hours did not coincide with the, the opportunity to you know, receive that food. And where they didn't have transportation, they couldn't make it to the schools. In addition to that, you know, we've seen that um, price gouging has been an issue. So where there are small stores in the neighborhoods or in the communities where farm workers live, they've talked to us about how, you know, the package of masa that used to cost X dollars had doubled, or the, you know, the 24 pack of water that they normally bought for their family had now, you know, increased substantially in price. And so when you're talking about already having limited funds and then having to deal with price gouging on top of that, that means you even have less, you know, to, to help support your family. I would think about 
one of the first farm worker women that I met when I was doing outreach here in Ohio where I live. And I think about how um, she was serving caldo, she was serving soup to her family. And I watched her soup serve her family and her family got the vegetables and, and the meat that were in the soup and she got broth. And I understood that she got the broth because there wasn't enough for her to also get meat or vegetables. This was years ago when I witnessed that and I've never forgotten it. And now when I talk to family members and community members like Sylvia, who talks to me about her eight children who don't have enough food, or Blanca, who's in California and has seven children and also has not been able to find food or been able to get um, support from the school to get the lunches. These are the stories that we have to tell and we have to talk about because until we improve the rights and conditions for farm workers who feed us, they're going to continue to suffer in this way. And I think that it is abhorrent that in this nation, we're relying on people to feed us, to sustain us, yet we as a nation have not had the moral fortitude to actually provide them with the rights and benefits that they need to make sure that they have everything that they need to survive and thrive. So that's the work that we're doing. We're proud to be in partnership with Tony and with all of you. And we look forward to doing the work to make sure that farm workers have what they need during this pandemic as well as going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, from my heart. Um, you have definitely raised this issue to me and, and now I'm a passionate supporter of our farm worker community, but it took you making me aware and so many of us aware. So thank you for your work, Germana. Uh, next up, we have three more and um, Next up is uh, another Monica, uh, this time from my hometown of Washington, D.C. Monica Gonzalez is the Associate Director of Government Relations at Share Our Strength, it's a very important organization in the space, No Kid Hungry, and she will be talking about feeding children through the pandemic. Monica. Yeah, thank you for having me here and for really convening this. Um, I don't know what more I could say because I think this has been a really esteemed panel who's really covered all of the ground. So let me just kind of go through these slides really quickly and make some other key points. Um, so next slide. Um, I think where, um, you know, we saw kind of a snapshot of California, I think it's really important to understand and to echo what has already been said. And that is that um, Latinos have not done well through this pandemic, but we were not doing well before. Um, that, you know, that Basically, we're seeing high rates, higher rates of food insecurity among Latino families and children. At the same time, they're also not doing well financially. So we can't ignore the connection between health and wealth, um, you know, at this particular time. So I think it's really critical to point this out. You know, Share Our Strength, we're really focused on ending child hunger. And so as we see more and more families experiencing food insecurity, we're also seeing high rates of hunger among children, where before the pandemic, one in seven children um, was experiencing or at risk of hunger. Today, one in four children are at risk of hunger, and that's all children. And so for Latinos, that's even higher. Next slide, please. Here you can see how hard this is hitting um, Latino families. When you look at these um, numbers, you can see that, you know, financially they're unable to just meet their basic needs, whether it's rent, gas, utilities, and food. Um, so that gives you a really good idea of how hard this is hitting these families. I also want to kind of acknowledge some of the other points that were made around public charge. And in this particular moment, when we're talking about systemic racism and we're talking about the legacy and the consequences of structural racism, imagine being a split status Latino family that's trying to choose between food and the path to citizenship. Um, that they might be choosing not to enroll their children in nutrition programs out of fear of a policy that might work against them in their quest to be citizens of the United States. So I just want to highlight that, that we're forcing families, Latino families, to choose between food um, for their kids 
and citizenship. And, and that's just unconscionable. Next slide, please. I also want to point out for children, we have to think about this. We have to think about the future of our children. We have to think about their health. Latinos suffer higher rates of chronic conditions, but that doesn't happen overnight. It happens very young when children are experiencing hunger and they're filling up on empty calories. We know that they're more sick, um, they recover more slow, slowly, and they spend more time in the hospital and emergency rooms. Um, and imagine that um, during a pandemic that we have very unhealthy children who may not be able to weather um, what is happening right now. Um, when we think about the development of children, food is critical to that. Malnourished kids, kids who are, you know, stressed about where their next meal is gonna come from, don't learn. They're not able to learn, they're not able to focus. And that has consequences on their future opportunities. And then again, you know, just having to choose between medicine and food, you know, choosing whether or not they send their kid, take their kid to a clinic um, to get cough medicine or food. This is what we're talking about right here. Next slide, please. And you know, for all of us, because all of us come to this work because some of us might have humble beginnings. And so we recognize that education is really critical to our path to wealth and to future opportunities. But you know, for children who experience hunger, um, you know, they tend to have a tougher time to be successful in school. Um, that means that they're not coming to school regularly, um, that their test sc scores are lower, and that some of them may not even be able to get through school um, at the high school age um, because they have had all these other barriers that they've had to overcome. And when we talk about this time and we talk about overall hunger and we're talking about different programs, you know, we have been advocating for child nutrition reauthorization. And, you know, we have seen in this particular time the response to be able to stand up and serve kids through grab and go. But we also need to make sure that those flexibilities exist all the time. Summer is the hungriest time of the year for kids. This is when they're out of school, their ability to access meals becomes even more limited. For rural kids, kids who are children of farm workers, their ability to access a summer meal becomes more limited. Um, they're not able to go to a summer meal site in the summertime because they might be taking care of brothers and sisters. They might have other responsibilities. So this is where the equity the aspect comes into the policies and the work that we do, that we must be equitable in all of our approaches that allow children to be able to access meals, breakfast after the bell, because they might have to be taking a, a sibling to school and they could miss that breakfast time if it's served before school time. So thank you, you know, Monica. When we think about food policy, we have to think about equity and making sure that we root out that systemic racism that comes with some of these policies. Thank you. It, it is so critical to have your point of view and especially from an organization that has been doing this work. So thank you so much. And especially when it's juxtaposed with some of the grassroots work that's being done. Um, it's a perfect complement to each other. Next up is Luis Aguilar, who is from uh, Fairfax, Virginia, and is the Virginia Director of CASA discussing targeting food access to the Latino community during the pandemic. Um, Luis will be followed by one more speaker and we'll close it out. Uh, Luis. Gracias y buenas tardes a todos. Es un honor y un placer compartir con ustedes. For the folks tuning in um, at CASA, we're a passionate uh, group of community conscious people that we organize, advocate, and expand opportunities for Latino immigrant and low-income community folks here in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. Um, do we do food distribution at Casa? We actually do not, we do not. We used to many years ago uh, when we were founded about three years ago, but we actually do not 
but the pandemic hit us and it has hit us like nothing else before uh, to the Latino community. So we, we respond to what the community members tell us, uh, tell us, we respond to what the community tells us and guides us to do. And so this is a need without a doubt. Um, uh, now as a director, but before as somebody who has had to go uh, and receive some of the support uh, through a food pantry, I think it's so incredibly necessary that we shift, that our organizations shift and do what is appropriate uh, during a time of need. Um, one of the things that we have been doing uh, in all across the three states, I'm going to focus more on Virginia, but across the three states with CASA is that we actually have done targeted food distribution. What do I mean by targeted? We are actually going to the neighborhoods that are hardest hit. Uh, I do know that in Maryland, for example, we have been in Baltimore and the surrounding counties, uh, as well as Montgomery County, Prince George County. In Pennsylvania, we have been in Lancaster and York. And in Virginia, we have been in Alexandria City, Fairfax County, and Prince William County. So we're serving about seven counties across three states. And so, again, the borders do not matter to us, whether they are state level or local levels, we are reaching out to our families right now. And we're talking about an immigrant population, not only Latino, but folks from Cameroon, Puerto Rico, Salvadorian, Guatemala, Mexican, uh, and, and others. Uh, specifically, what are we doing in Virginia? Uh, we are targeting, again, we did a, initially what we did is we assessed the situation by one, community organ, organizing. We had the conversations with our people, with our community. But secondly, we, we wanted to figure out the data so we surveyed our folks. We had an initial survey of 277 folks. Uh, and the first two weeks, as soon as we heard the uh, term pandemic, we got into action, we surveyed folks, and we said, what is it that you need right now the most? Number one, rental assistance. Number two, utility assistance. What is number three? Food access. And so our people were keenly aware of what they needed. And so we got to work. We we had no option but to get to work. Uh, so uh, after being uh, aware of this knowledge, we moved quickly to partner up with folks. We reached out to the localities of the county to partner up with them to ensure that we had uh, access to this uh, to the central food banks and so that they would supply this. And two, so that they would distribute it and do it in a way in which they were encouraging folks to access this without asking for identification, without a asking for... Uh, any status without any barriers and we are continuously urging them to provide uh, ways to transport this food to people's doors because they otherwise they are failing we have seen that the federal level has completely 100 percent failed our community uh, states are incredibly slow and bureaucratic but localities can do a little bit more an example of that is the partnership we're doing in fairfax county as of now they have over 70 percent of those who have covid are Latinos, and so we are urging them, you have to do something. Uh, luckily, one of the supervisors, Supervisor Rodney Lusk, stepped up and he uh, partnered up with a corporation to provide uh, food for over 1,000 families. We were out yesterday distributing this food, and we're doing this every Thursday. We get it, we pick it up, we partner, we put it on masks, and we, out, we go out to those communities. I mean, we have to be on the road. We have to be with our communities to guide them through this process. What is it that we learn the most? One, it's the relationships. If we are building these relationships with, with government, uh, such as we typically do when we advocate and organize our communities for things such as driver's licenses, then we can quickly shift and utilize these relationships to get them to work. Because again, we had some state senators who were distributing food that were doing delivery, deliveries. Again, this is their constituents. Uh, we had the sponsor of the driver's licenses bill, Senator, State Senator uh, Scott Serva. This is this is their constituents. They need to serve them. At the same time, we have stories of the cure needs, such as Jessica in Fairfax County, who told us a story that I had not heard until I lived it back again in the same neighborhood in which I grew up. She told me that uh, she was not actually sending her kids to the school to pick up the meals because her husband tested positive for COVID-19, and she did not want to expose others. But what is it causing? It's causing our families to go hungry, and we cannot accept this reality. This is completely unacceptable. Uh, this is why we quickly shift into this new way of working, and we will continue until the, there is less need. And again, that's the, that's the lesson that and the takeaway 
is that we have to make government work. We have to hold it accountable uh, from the bottom up because we've seen that from the top down, it's not working right now, but we can definitely push them for that. And so again, I want to thank everybody that uh, uh, gave you, Luis. time. We appreciate it. Now to close it out, my brother Elvis Cordova from Massachusetts, but living here in Washington, D.C. He is the brand new Vice President of Public Policy and Advocacy, National Recreation and Park Association, and a better man I don't know. He will be discussing resources offered by local parks and recreation agencies. Um, Elvis, close it out, and then I will close it out. Thank you very much, Tony. Appreciate the invitation, the warm introduction, and um, it's really an honor to be with so many passionate and smart individuals. Um, I just learned so much in this particular channel and hope that I can provide information. It's always a hard job to follow such a good group. Um, so I'm hopefully going to provide new information that begins to kind of interweave a lot of what we've been talking about. Um, to tell you a little bit about the organization, National Recreation and Park Association represents all local, state, and park agencies and recreation centers throughout the country. That's about 10,000 of them. The organization has been around 50 years, and we provide an array of services focusing around wellness, conservation, social equity. Those are our three pillars, and our advocacy works reflects that. Um, really, we're working to enhance park and park programmings during this particular time. If you could, for a moment, close your eyes and imagine a world without parks. And where would you have gone during this pandemic? To relax, to connect, and to just relieve your stress. And so you can open them now, thank you. But hopefully that had a visceral effect on you because like many of the other subjects we've talked about, whether it be the farm workers, whether it be the social programs, we take these for granted in our society. And it's really important for us to raise our voices and advocate, to collect the right information, to be able to reach the right audiences, to really remind the public that these services are not amenities, but these are essential services that a society needs to really thrive. Um, and so we have been working as much as we can to support our membership of park and recreation agencies throughout the country to really be able to we, the, give them the resources to provide for the public. One example of this is really extending the national school lunch program so that it can be provided at recreation centers while schools were closed. Um, and really beginning to shift the focus of nutrition and education um, to really provide healthier eating habits for our community. This is just as important um, you know, as addressing the hunger issues that we have here is to really establish, especially within our young generation, these healthy eating habits and nutritious that will lead to their better health um, going forward. I did have a presentation, um, which I know that Brenda and Tony will share later, um, which references a lot of what I'll be talking about here as well as encapsulates a lot of uh, links to some of the organizations we talked about, um, like Feeding America and No Child Hungry, um, so you'll have the links there. Um, but what's important here is that we're looking to reduce barriers to social determinants of health, uh, including healthy food access for underserved populations. And this is, throughout the leadership, a big mantra of what we're doing. And we're reimagining parks as nutrition hubs. And that means they have trusted gathering places that provide access to affordable, healthy foods, essential nutrition that supports food insecure, that supports the reduction of food insecurity, strengthens healthy uh, decision making around nutrition, and improves the health outcomes. Now, one of these ways is farmers markets. I had the great benefit of working at USDA um, along with Lisa in my prior um, service in government. And we were really able to extend farmers markets. Um, now, sure, that's great, right? We were able to extend them to about uh, just under 10,000 farmers markets throughout the countries. But as we all know, sometimes the farmers markets are a little bit more expensive than um, you would find at your supermarket. So what we've really done is really begin to combine our efforts um, by making sure that these farmers markets accept the supplemental nutrition benefit payments, the SNAP, or what used to be um, uh, a lot of the, uh, the, uh, 
oh my god i just went blank the uh, food stamp program thank you um and uh making sure that WIC benefits and what we're seeing is that 62 percent of park and recreation agencies are hosting farmers markets which link arts cultural events nutritional education health screening and social services at these markets which is important because sometimes our community can't even access health uh, and through partnerships with vendors, we can provide them with health screenings there. Um, we also have 37% um, percent of these farmers markets provide intergenerational family services, um, which is a great benefit for many families. Um, and 43% of those markets are uh, accepting uh, the SNAP program, the former food stamp program, along with the WIC benefits programs. Now, another aspect in which we're looking to really enhance uh, people's livelihoods is through community gardens and community education. And that's really working with um, schools um, so that our park and recreation agencies manage community gardens um, that provide youth with knowledge of healthy eating habits and how to grow their own food um, and encourage healthier lifestyles with programming on nutrition and healthy cooking. Um, and this is important, too, because this begins to embed uh, a healthy lifestyle for our community, which is greatly needed. Um, and sometimes these particular community gardens provide um, donated food to food banks, senior, senior, senior centers, and other community partners um, that can help out. And are also really looking to now enhance their cooperation with food banks so that information can be provided at um, these particular farmer, farmers market and community garden centers. Um, and so we are really looking to increase engagement in services because local access is the key here. Um, sure, it's nice to be able to go to Yosemite and nice to be able to go to the Grand Canyon, but how many in our community have the, the uh, resources to do that, right? Um, and so local parks are more important than ever because they give us the opportunity to be able to access um, not only the resources I mentioned of farmers gardens and community gardens, but they give us the access to really touch base with nature again. I mean, our community is one that respects nature and our community is one that is connected to nature. Um, and so to allow us to be able to reconnect with each other and with nature uh, is an important part of what we're looking to do. Um, and there's, there's a danger in that, right? Because like any of the other social programs we talked about, parks are often the first ones to be cut particularly during this pandemic. Um, and these are no cost services to our citizens. So if they are cut, they don't have the benefit of, you know, getting a membership um, to be able to get exercise at any other facility. Um, so we are working really hard to be able to uh, work with our federal partners, work with community organizations, and really affect the laws at the national level that we'll be able to provide added resources for our local parks so that they can be these nutrition hubs um, for our communities. Um, so with that being thank said, you. I want to thank you very much for the presentation, Tony. I appreciate it. Um, okay, everyone, that wraps up the Charla. Thank you very much. Um, please check out our social media posts for information about the upcoming Charla on Tuesday, about being a better ally to the Black community, and the Pride Charla on Friday. Stay safe, stay connected, stay actionable. Thanks, everyone.